Stanford University. The Human Experience. Inside the Humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu. Today I want to talk to you about the tragic passions from Shakespeare to Verdi. And it's important to understand that, particularly from about 1550 to 1800, pathos, uh, which could mean suffering, but was usually interpreted to mean a kind of emotional suffering, was thought to be at the very heart of tragedy. Readers of Aristotle saw that although there were other elements of tragedy, such as recognitions or reversals, the one thing that no tragedy could do without was pathos. And therefore, they really conceived of a tragedy as the good imitation of a series of passions that were intended to press the audience through an affective series of passions, particularly emphasizing wonder, pity, and fear so that the end of tragedy, the purgation of those passions, could be achieved. Now, what purgation meant, uh, not everybody agreed on or understood, because Aristotle was extremely cryptic on the subject. Some thought of it as a kind of medical process in which, through a sort of surfeit or overflowing of the emotions, you, uh, you underwent a kind of emotional uh, correction and achieved a new equilibrium. Others uh, thought of it as more of a teaching process in which, uh, by feeling emotions in particular situations, you were taught how to feel rightly when you should feel pity or when you should feel fear. And that that was precisely uh, what would inculcate the pro proper sort of emotional habitus, that instinct where you just had the right feelings associated uh, with the right events that made you a moral person. But either way, uh, you understood catharsis at the time. The passions were central to tragedy. However, uh, well, first of all, we should say, what was a passion? A passion was usually defined by the time as the spiritual motion by which a mind judged whether an object before it was either good or bad, and then felt either attracted to it or repulsed by it. And we'll get back to that definition in a moment. Uh, what's important is that the passions were thought to be neither like simple thoughts nor absolutely like all feelings of the body, but they were in inextricably connected to both. So Descartes, for instance, said, well, passions are not things like sight uh, or t touch, because those concern external objects. And it's not hunger, because that concerns only the body. But it's all the other emotions of the soul in which the soul feels a kind of passive suffering when it's buffeted. And at the time, the word emotions was actually not commonly used. But he suggested that we should use the word emotions, because there were no feelings in the soul that were so violent as these things like wonder, like fear, like pity that the tragic passions uh, and tragedians wanted to arouse. OK. Now, because the passions were associated both with the mind and with the body, that meant that if you were a tragic playwright and you were trying to represent the passions on stage, as there were advances in medicine or changes in psychological theories, that was going to change the way you would represent emotions like pity or fear. So what I propose uh, to do today is, um, is to basically outline some moments in the history of theater when there are changes in the way the tragic passions are conceived. Okay? And before we get that, let me just show, my, uh, show this slide to, sh um, to underline the way in which people thought about uh, the, the way you should interpret a script. This is a passage from Hamlet. Um, it's the, the moment when Claudius is feeling repentant. And you can see there's a little emotional script at the top that says that the actor is supposed to go from remorse uh, to attempt toward repentance, toward obduracy and despair. And then there are more details going down the margin. So this is the way people were taught to act at the time. You would read a script, and you would essentially jot in the passions you were supposed to be performing. So it just shows how central it was to their conception of what was going on. But now, I'm going to uh, talk about these four kind of time slices in theatrical history. And the first one I'm going to pick out is about 1590, right at the beginning of Shakespeare's career. And what I say about the passions then will be pretty much true from about 1550 to 1650, a time when Galenic medicine, uh, the, which we'll get into, uh, the ancient uh, Greek um, physician, those theories uh, obtained and influenced the way people understood the passions. 
The second uh, time slice that I'll look at is from about 1650 to 1750, when there's a bit of a change in medical theories and a more Cartesian idea of the body as something more like a machine becomes uh, more common. And that changes the way people write their tragedies. And that's the model you should really think of when you read Racine or Dryden or listen to a Handel opera or listen to a Vivaldi opera. The third slice I'll look at is, uh, comes right after that, around uh, 1750 and later, when the association of psychology of John Locke and new theories of nerve physiology that start to uh, get people thinking about feelings more as a vibration of the nerves that's closer to the vibrations of the string of a musical instrument. And that, again, changes the way people want to represent the passions on stage. And that's what you really ought to be listening for, for things that are written from 1760 to 1800. Um, operas by Gluck and some of his contemporaries. And then finally, we'll look at the sort of romantic revolution in which um, Shakespeare is uh, fully embraced by tragedians all over the, the world, not just in England. And what they conceive to be his organic form becomes the model for the way the passions ought to be represented and moved on stage. So those are going to be the four sort of time points I'm going to move through. So let's start with the first model. Uh, I said a moment ago that a passion was a spiritual movement or operation of the mind in which it was attracted or repelled by an object that it's come to know. And I want to focus on this question of the spirits. What are these spiritual movements? Well, according to Galen, the ancient Greek doctor, the spirits were themselves the product of a refining process in the body. And there were three types of them. There were natural, vital, and animal spirits. We probably all know the expression animal spirits from Wall Street. Right? That's, that's where it comes from. It goes way back. <laughs> so the natural spirits were produced in the liver from the production of the blood and were conveyed through the body and veins. Then the vital spirits uh, traveled through the arteries um, and were also thought elsewhere in the universe uh, to make the stars glow because it was thought that people were made up of the elements of the universe. And those were refined in the liver. And then finally, the animal spirits were refined in the brain. And those were what brought sensory information to the brain and also uh, sent the messages from the brain to initiate gestures or other sorts of physical emotions. So this is, um, it was also thought then that an imbalance of the four humors could affect the production and distribution of spirits, um, of these spirits. But mostly, any kind of sudden flux or reflux of them was thought to be caused by the mind's attraction or repulsion to some object, OK? So that um, when people thought about the passions in this period, they really thought a bit about there being this almost physical rush of air going through little tiny tubes in your body, you can think of it that way, and forcing a particular uh, response or reaction of flee, you know, I see danger, or go toward her, she is beautiful, right? Um, so as the soul passively suffered the sometimes violent movements of the spirits and fluids of the body, uh, if they were very powerful, it felt like you were caught in a storm. And that was one of the loci classici, this, the passages that came from um, classical literature that people imitated a lot in the Renaissance. And I've given that to you as number one on your handout. There are many examples, but this is from Seneca's Medea, where she says, a double tide tosses me, uncertain of my course, as when rushing winds rage warfare, and from both sides conflicting floods lash the seas and the fluctuating waters boil, even so my heart is tossed." Okay? And that imagery then becomes commonplace in the church uh, fathers, and they speak constantly of the passions as undulating seas or blowing tempests. Okay? Now these comparisons between the human body and the processes of nature were actually promoted by the fact that the ancient Greeks felt a taboo against anatomizing human corpses. And therefore, they were led to analogize um, about what could be going on inside the body by looking at natural processes that they were able to observe more easily. And that encouraged the idea that man was a microcosm of the universe. And here we can see a Renaissance uh, text that's based on Galenic theories of medicine. And if you look right in the very center there, it's very difficult to read, but four times over, you'll see complexion written. Your complexion was thought to be the balance of the four humors inside your body, of blood, yellow bile, phlegm, and black bile. Okay, these days, we think of complexion as being about skin color. But at the time, people thought that if you were dark complected, say you were a black African, that was because you had more black bile inside your system. Or if you were a ruddy complected English person, you were of sanguinary disposition. 
So they actually thought that the skin was transparent and in some sense what you were seeing were the fluids beneath the skin. So that's why we use the word complexion that way, but they mean it as this kind of balance. Okay, if you move out from that, you can see that there are the four humors of blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And then if you continue to move out, you can see that all of these four elements are mapped on to other things. Each one has a time of life. Okay, so that if you're youthful, you're a choleric. If you're an adolescent, you're sanguinary. If you're middle-aged, you're phlegmatic. If you're an old man, you're melancholy. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're also connected with the four winds, with the four seasons of the year, with the four elements of the world, which were thought to be air, fire, water, and earth, with their tutelary planets, and with their constellations. So it's really important to know that when you're watching a tragedy of Shakespeare or one of his contemporaries, they really think of the hero on stage as being connected to the whole universe. And when someone talks about, say, being star-crossed lovers, that has a kind of immediacy to them that it would not have to us because the stars actually are affecting people's passions and their humoral dispositions depending on how they're being governed. This is the sort of worldview that we find in Julius Caesar when Antony remembers Brutus. This is number two on your handout. And he says, his life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. But these are the elements he's thinking about. They really are the elements of the universe and the same elements that appear in the stars and el elsewhere. Now, if we consider this model, uh, which is from a Paracelsian medical text, Paracelsus was a Renaissance medical reformer who didn't agree with Galen on everything, but also accepted much of his stuff. And again, you can see a kind of attempt to map the universe on the human body so that the lowest reaches of the earth are like the bowels, the heart is like the life-giving sun, the mind uh, is like the celestial light and so forth. So once again, the main thing I want to underline here is this mapping of the human body onto the universe and vice versa. And all of this should help us understand a passage from Titus Andronicus that I'd like to look at. And let's set the scene here. Titus has returned from war against the Goths uh, in which most of his sons had died for Rome and he had a lot of them. Um, in an ill-advised move, he's decided to sacrifice the eldest son of the goth queen in the tomb of his ancestors, and that gets the queen upset. Uh, she sets about with her apprentice, Aaron the Moor, on a bloody course of revenge. They manage to kill Titus. Well, no, actually, they don't kill her. That would have been more merciful. They rape the uh, daughter of Titus, cut out her tongue, and lop off her hands so that she can't reveal who has done the crime, all the time doing this on the dead body of her husband. Then they frame two of Titus's uh, sons for the murder and have them executed. Then they tell Titus that if only he cuts off his own hand and sends it to the emperor, he'll at least get his sons back. So he gladly lops off his hand, sends it, and gets only the heads of his son back, which was a little less than he was counting on. So uh, that's all to say that Titus has a lot to complain about at this point. <laughs> and we'll see that he does. Um, and when you listen here, you'll see that there's a very programmatic sort of association. I'm sorry about the music. Can't do anything about it. Um, programmatic association between uh, his own feelings, you know, his own passions. He compares himself to the seas. I can do something about it. I'll turn it down. Um, and then the size of his daughter Lavinia, who has been raped and mutilated, to the blowing of the winds. And there's this very kind of programmatic association between himself as a microcosm of the universe uh, as he talks about his grief. Oh, here I lift this one hand up to heaven and bow this feeble ruin to the earth. If any power pities wretched tears, to that I call. <sighs> what wouldst thou kneel with me? Do then, dear heart. For heaven shall hear our prayers, or with our sighs we'll breathe the welkin dim and stain the sun with fog, as sometime clouds, when they do hug him in their melting bosoms. Oh, brother, speak with possibility, and do not break into these deep extremes. <laughs> Are not my sorrows deep, having no bottom? Then be my passions bottomless with them. But yet let reason govern thy lament. <laughs> If there were reason for these miseries, then into limits can I find my woes! 
When heaven doth wait, doth not the earth outflow. If the winds rage, doth not the sea wax mad, threatening the welkin with his big swollen face? Wouldst thou have a reason for this coil? <laughs> I am the sea. Hark how her sighs do blow. She is the weeping welkin, I the earth. Then must my sea be moved with her sighs. Then must my earth, with her continual tears, become a deluge overflowed and drowned. For why my bowels cannot hide her woes, but like a drunkard must I vomit them? So, um, so later on in Shakespeare, he doesn't always connect the dots between the uh, nature and the body so, um, so precisely. This is a, Titus is a young work from Shakespeare. But when we're watching something like King Lear and we hear him say, blow winds and crack your cheeks, rage blow your cataracts and hurricano spout when Lear is on the heath, we're still be me uh, meant to be thinking about this relationship between the body and the storm outside and the passions within Lear. Okay, so that's my first time slice. The second one uh, is from about 1650 to 1750, and it's encouraged by a couple of different developments. One of them is that by that time, uh, Aristotle's poetics were the first major commentaries on them start to appear in Italy in about 1550. And people start to theorize uh, on the, uh, have the idea that any of the arts may be able to um, arouse these motions of pity and terror and wonder that are necessary to accomplish a cathartic effect. But if you want them all to coordinate, which was especially important for an art form like opera, then it seemed like it would be a good idea to have a kind of universal rhetoric of the passions in which if a librettist wrote down something about love, a musician would know how to set it, or an actress would know how to perform it. So there's a real attempt to uh, create a kind of taxonomy of, um, of the passions. And on the one hand, uh, most theorists say, yes, of course, the passions are as numerous and as difficult to define as the winds and the tides. However, let's give it a shot. And the shot they do is uh, the most basic um, model breaks down four basic passions. And we can think about these on a kind of Cartesian plane. In the present, you feel either joy or grief, right? And in the future of something that you're looking forward to, you look forward to it either with, either with desire or with fear, OK? And these emotions essentially get uh, expressed either vertically so that triumph, uh, your spirits are elated, and you basically want to hold your hands up or stand up high. You want to jump for joy, right? Whereas if you're feeling the sadness or despair, the facial features droop, the hands uh, hang low, and so forth. And we know pictures of Lady Macbeth, for instance, Laden, uh, Lady Macbeth. She's always depicted as drooping her hands like that. Um, on the other hand, the vertical and the horizontal axis can be used in combination. The horizontal axis is what indicates whether you want to go toward an object or away from it. Um, but in gestures like Odium, the one on uh, your left, she's not only repulsed by the object, but there is an indication with the hands held down at the waist that the object is beneath her, right? Maybe it's an un, uh, unsuitable suitor. Uh, on the other hand, on your right, the gesture of terror is of aversion as well, but the hands up suggest that the, there's a sense that the, of the objects having superior power, maybe being a god or something horrifying, right? So these two axes can be used in complex ways in combination, but that is the basic grid uh, that's operating. Um, now it's useful to keep this grid in mind when you read 17th century dramatists like Dryden or Racine. Uh, and I want to take an example from Dryden's All for Love, which is a restoration rewriting of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. And at the very beginning of that tragedy, Antony enters at the ab absolute low ebb. Uh, you know, Caesar is winning. Antony thinks he has no future. And this is number five on your handout. And he comes in and says, they tell me tis my birthday, and I'll keep it with double pomp of sadness. Tis what the day deserves, which gave me breath. Why was I raised the meteor of the world, hung in the skies, the bl and blazing I traveled till all my fires were spent and then cast downward to be trod out by Caesar. Ventidius, his faithful uh, sidekick, says in an aside, oh, my soul, tis mournful, wondrous mournful. Antony, count thy gains now, Antony. Wouldst thou be born for this? 
glutton of fortune, thy devouring youth has starved thy wanting age. And Tidius, how sorrow shakes him. So now the tempest tears him up by the roots, and on the ground extends the noble ruin. And Antony at this point would be extended completely flat on the ground, which uh, by the standards of the 17th century was a very drastic gesture, right? Because people had a sense of dignity. Lie there, thou shadow of an emperor. So he's addressing himself. The place thou pressest on thy mother earth is all thy empire now. Now it contains thee. Some few days hence, and then twill be too large. When thou art contracted in thy narrow urn, shrunk to a few cold ashes, then Octavia, his Roman wife, for Cleopatra will not live to see it, Octavia then will have thee all her own and bear thee in her widowed hand to Caesar. So this is a grand stage picture, obviously. It's the ultimate use of the vertical axis with the, uh, with the hero completely dejected dejected and spread out on stage. And Dryden wants to do that in part because he wants to use all of Act I to work slowly up to re reviving Antony and having him make a heroic exit at the very end of the act. And he'll do this over and over again five times until Antony dies. But uh, at the end of Act I, he's gotten Antony uh, back into fighting spirits. And Antony says, number six on your handout, come on, my soldier. He's talking to Ventidius. Our hearts and arms are still the same. I long once more to meet our foes, that thou and I, like time and death, marching before our troops, may taste fate to him, mow him out a passage, and entering where the foremost squadrons yield, begin the noble harvest of the field. This incredible, you know, it's the, he's the grim reaper coming to mow down the opposing army. And Dryden is very interested in working in these big uh, movements across acts on this vertical and horizontal axis. He also uses the horizontal axis. For instance, this is number seven on your handout. Ventidius surprises him with his Roman wife and his children, which ought to, uh, Ventidius thinks, uh, spark some sense of uh, duty in Antony and love for his own family. But instead, Antony instinctively withdraws from them in horror. And Ventidius looks at him and says, look on her, meaning his wife. View her well, and those she brings, are they all strangers to your eyes? Has nature no secret call, no whisper that they are yours? So again, it's this use of the horizontal axis there. That what he should be attracted to, one would think, his wife and his children, he's instead repulsed by because he's in love with Cleopatra. right? OK, and to give one more example of, a, of effective use of this horizontal passage, in, a, in some ways, anti-version of Antony and Cleopatra that the French tragedian Racine wrote, Berenice, um, the, French, uh, the Roman emperor, uh, wants to marry a foreign queen, but isn't supposed to because that's against Roman law. And she decides that although they've been in love for many years, she will basically just walk away from him and um, leave him to be emperor. And that's all she does at the end of, tra of the tragedy. No one dies. Nothing happens. It all depends on our feeling that the ability of someone in love to walk away is somehow, um, you know, incredibly takes an incredible uh, act of will. So again, it's that use of the vertic of the horizontal axis, but this time um, in a quite different way. So. Um, I mentioned as well that there was a desire to kind of focus in on what particular emotions would look like. How should we express joy? How should we express fear? And this leads to a kind of uh, um, convergence on particular conventional ways of, uh, of expressing feelings. For instance, Monteverdi, the early Italian opera composer, says that he's lighted on a new way of expressing anger. And that is to have repeated 16th notes in the bass line underneath the voice of the person. That's the stilo concitato, which he thinks is a new discovery for the expression of anger. Uh, another thing that he lighted upon that was very popular was to use a, a repeated descending bass beneath the voice of the singer to express grief, usually a minor uh, descending minor tetrachord that you might know from Bach's um, Mass in D minor. It's used for the crucifixus there or the death of Dido from Dido and Aeneas, and it's used in many other places. Um, and also developing out of this, um, this kind of Cartesian moment, you could think of it opera seria as being the logical extension of that with, um, with, with a desire to create essentially a gallery of monuments to the passions that are staged through a series of arias that are relatively distinct from one another. So they have a kind of 
uh, a musical integrity. Um, they're not necessarily super well integrated into the libretto, and often um, they have a da capo form so that they, that they state a theme, they state some, uh, another theme briefly in the middle, and then they return and state the theme again. And so I want to show you just a moment of a Handelian opera, uh, I mean a Handelian aria, which is far too long to um, play the whole thing, uh, but we'll just get a sense. actually goes on for about another five minutes. Um, and so you can imagine uh, with that style of dramaturgy, you tend to need to work this, the character into a situation that deserves five to seven minutes of emoting. And then the person normally needs to exit the stage because what can follow that, right? So that's their usually exit arias are very common in opera seria. Okay, so the, the model I'd like you to keep in mind for the second paradigm, the ideal that the critics actually talk about is essentially that this should be like walking through a gallery, a long gallery in which you see a series of statues that are monuments to different passions, and that's what they're trying to accomplish at this time. And they do it in different ways, but, uh, but arias are obviously um, one very successful way of doing it. Now, in the early 18th century then, we begin to see some changes in the way theatrical passions are conceived. So now we're entering my third time slice. Um, in the 17th century, they had mostly used central point perspective stages because there was this idea that you wanted very clear, very pure expressions of very strong and vehement passions. But then we start to see stages like this that are set on an oblique angle. Okay, this first one was published in 1703. Um, and this is in part because by this time, Locke's sensationalist psychology had encouraged the idea that the greater the size of the object contemplated or recalled, the greater the feeling or thought of that res uh, that would result. So we have a huge emphasis on grandeur on the stage. And we also have a sense of that associations are important. So in fact, you want to see multiple events occurring in front of the stage setting because the stage setting in some ways is picking up associations from the drama that has been going on in front of it. So rather than trying to surprise people with sudden scene changes, they want the scenes themselves to acquire associations from the drama. Um, and you can see there's also a greater emphasis now on things that are hidden or inviting the imagination of the audience to enter onto the stage rather than impressing the audience with forceful images. And something like this invites us to ask, what's around the corner? What's down the stairs? What what could be coming from above and so forth. So it's a different kind of ideal. Uh, we might think of Hume's, David Hume's observation, nothing more powerfully excites an affection that's a passion than to conceal some part of its object by throwing it in a kind of shade, which at the same time that it shows enough to prepossess us in favor of the object, leaves still some work for the imagination. Okay, so this idea that you, that you want to invite an answering call from the imagination. In 1769, Daniel Webb published a book called Observations on the Correspondence Between Poetry and Music. And in that, he said that although he's willing to accept the received opinion that the mind under certain affections excites particular vibrations and nerves and impresses certain movements in the animal spirits, 
he didn't think it was possible to create a universal rhetoric of the passions. He said that in order to treat all the passions with precision, we would have to understand all of their modes and then fix unalienable signs on each particular feeling. But providence, he said, had actually provided better for us. By making that impossible, it had given us the pleasures of the imagination. And that's what he wanted uh, to see instead of this dream of a kind of universal, perfect rhetoric of the passions that, uh, that was around in 1650. He said that musical pleasure could never be the result of any fixed and permanent idea of the nerves and spirits, that it sprung from a succession of impressions and was augmented by sudden or gradual transitions from one kind or strain of vibration to another. So someone like Richard Steele had really admired the castrato actor and singer uh, Nicolini because he had been able to strike one po the posture of one classical statue after another while he was on stage. But Webb says that it's contrary to the nature of passion to rest at any fixed point. What he's interested in are mid-tints and chains of feeling that run through works. Okay, so that's an important change that we start to get in the mid-18th century. And the person who answers the call best in opera is Christoph Gluck, who uh, writes a number of reform operas starting in 1769. And I'd like to show you one little scene from uh, Alceste. And there, he does lots of interesting things in Alceste. For instance, he, has, uh, in a, he uses the capo areas, but really makes the B section surprising so that uh, thoughts of her children suddenly intrude on her when she's happy about the idea that she's decided to die for her husband. Then she thinks, ah, oh, but what about my children? Uh, and that's a little bit different than you would see before. He's also interested in the kind of layerings of feeling. And that's what I want to show you here. This is a moment of celebration when, in which the whole kingdom believes that their king, Admetus, has uh, come back from the brink of the grave. Uh, so that's a good thing. And he and his wife love each other very much, so that's good. So they're essentially uh, celebrating, um, think that they're going to be able to celebrate their reunion. But what only Alceste knows is the only reason Admetus is alive now is that she has volunteered to die for him. So uh, Gluck is interested in the contrast between the rejoicing of everybody else and the private sorrow of Alceste, which is indicated in this production by a veil that drops down between them. <laughs> So anyway, so that's the third time slice that I wanted to show you. It's a time that's very much connected with all the prior history. A Gluck uh, still probably has closer connections to someone like Monteverdi than those uh, who come after. But there still is this interest in mid-tints of passions, in passions coming in groups rather than being clearly defined, in a kind of overlaying of resonances, um, the mixing of joyous music with, uh, with the spectacle of a private sorrow in front and that sort of thing, okay? And then the fourth um, big moment I want to talk about occurs after the publication of Kant's major works um, in the 1780s and 90s, and that leads to a couple of different things. First of all, for the first time in history, pathos is no longer considered to be central to tragedy. Uh, German philosophers in particular decide that what's the, called the Kantian paradox often the idea that we are morally free and yet absolutely bound and suppressed beneath necessity is what's at the heart of Greek tragedy. 
And they then try to separate off Greek tragedy from modern tragedy. And they say, Greek tragedy was Greek tragedy. Uh, the moderns are something different. We live with Christianity. We live with subjectivity. Uh, and they decide that Shakespeare is the great modern playwright. Shakespeare, throughout Europe, had not been so highly esteemed up until that time, even though he had always been valued um, in England. And, um, and they pick Shakespeare as a kind of, uh, well, they like to call him a northern a poet or a Gothic poet uh, because they are sick of the hegemony of French neoclassicism and they are annoyed that Napoleon is invading their country. Uh, so <laughs> they decide to uh, pick Shakespeare as the beginning of what they think will be a great German dramatic tradition that will be northern and not classical and southern. And, uh, and they have to make sense of Shakespeare, uh, as does someone like Coleridge, uh, who doesn't doesn't um, look very good if you judge him by Aristotelian standards. He, his works are not unified. He mixes the serious and the comic. Um, there are all sorts of problems with Shakespeare. Uh, so the, the method they come up with is to talk about organic form rather than mechanic beauties or regular beauties. And they really insist on this idea of organicism. And they furthermore, uh, they and English critics, promote character now all of a sudden as a unifying force. If, some, if there is a character who is great and powerful, that can be a form of cohesion in and of itself, which is an idea that's not apparent in Aristotle and is based largely on the novel, which is now a new genre. People are reading Richardson and so forth, and they're getting this idea of character as a central element of literary criticism. Um, OK, so, so what that basically does is it encourages, um, I guess you would call a kind of a looser conception of the passions, one in which things like memory uh, can intrude on desire and are more important, in which the passions are thought to be very much associated with the depiction of character, um, and in which there is an effort to give a kind of cohesion to works that appears to be in some ways organic rather than strictly regular. They often use the comparison. They say the old style was like the French clipped uh, boxwood hedges in the parterre of a formal French garden. We want to make English landscape gardens in which it all seems like natural. It all seems like nature, and one vista leads on to another, and there are weeds growing beneath the oaks, but it's all more grand. Okay, and so uh, I, for my example of that, I actually want to take an example. It's quite late. It's from 1880, but I think it's it's a uh, verity. It's telling that. So anyway, so I, I'm picking Verdi, and it's telling that Verdi looks to Shakespeare as the great tragedian he wants to uh, turn into opera, right? Whereas someone like Gluck, whom we had to see in our imagination, uh, did Euripides over and over again. So there, it was still Euripides that had the great prestige in the 1780, whereas by the time Verdi is writing at Shakespeare. And I'll just show you the very last moment of Othello, uh, one of Verdi's last works. And what's important here, I think, is that the theme that plays as he tries to kiss the dead Desdemona is a theme that has played throughout the work at key moments, for instance, when they kissed each other after, their, uh, after uh, reminiscing about their early loves, when they're supposed to be going off to their wedded bliss, and at other key moments like that. So Verdi's trying to suggest that uh, memories and desire and uh, the passions are all sort of interconnected in this uh, complex moment. Three are two 
uh, that's, that's basically the end of my lecture. The Human Experience, Inside the Humanities at Stanford University, humanexperience.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.